with the C sharp minor prelude, we enter a different emotional world altogether if we compare it to the last three. The first three preludes were, and fugue actually, were relatively simple in their makeup. As we've seen, they were didactic. And now there is also a didactic purpose, and I'll talk about it. But immediately we see that we are on a much higher musical plane altogether. I'll play the beginning. Here you cannot say that Bach is working with limited material. He's writing a fully blown, bloom piece of music um, that although is not pianistically or instrumentally taxing, he's not restricting himself at all. The aim though is to teach uh, what is called a cantabile style of playing. So drawing a sound that makes the instrument sing, which is difficult on the piano, really hard on the harpsichord. But that is what is, uh, what is aimed at here. The prelude is a magnificent piece. And yet the, in this pair, it is the fugue that carries the most weight, and that's why I'm going to talk about it more than, uh, than the prelude. Now, the first thing to notice is that the fugue is, has five voices. You won't find more voices uh, in a fugue by Bach, at least not in the well-tempered clavier. Five voices with ten fingers and two hands is quite complicated to do, and that means the texture is really dense. It is a style of writing which is called stile antico. Now, what is this? That is a style of polyphonic writing which refers directly to the Renaissance polyphony of Palestrina. And, uh, and of course, we call it antico because by the time Bach was writing it, writing that sort of thing was making a conscious reference to the past. I'll play you the beginning. So it is severe and somber, deeply expressive. You could imagine it sung by, a, at least so far, a male choir. So it's a, it's a weaved sort of pattern um, in, a, in a style which feels religious and slightly severe. That is a typical stile antico. And there are some more examples, both in this book and in the second book. And, I'll, uh, and there are often at, at least four voices, and more often five. Uh, it has another peculiarity is that it has not one, but three subjects. The first one, which is quite simple, only four notes. <laughs> occupy us for all of the first quarter of the piece. Now, after a little while, another theme comes. <laughs> Here. 
So it is simply. going on and on again. It provides a sort of backdrop of even texture against other things are attaching themselves. Then fairly shortly after comes a third subject. Um, which has a great expressive power with a repeated note. Of course, the point of having a three subject fugue is that you will at some point quite soon try to combine them together. And uh, it is always designed to work if you want. You can't put any old theme with another and most of the time it won't. But those have been conceived to be able to mix. And it is not at all rare that you will find the three subjects working together at the same time. Let me try to find, yes, I can find you an example. Here we had at least three times the three subjects working together as a team. It is an incredible piece of music. Comes a moment where everything is happening at the same time. You have the same subject combining in different voices with another on the another part. It's completely fascinating. You can't, that's why the delight of studying the score and playing it is that you can unpack the texture, take the pieces together. As a listener, it would be almost impossible. You have to take it as a whole. And those subjects are, if you want, the DNA of the music. They are not supposed to be identified, heard, and separated from the rest. It helps to create the magnificent impression of the fugue as a whole. <laughs> 